everyone, and welcome to Docker Compose Simplifying Container Automation Webinar with CBT Nuggets trainer Sean Powers and CBT Nuggets DevOps team member Nathan Bank. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that the chat pod is available to ask any questions. At the end of the webinar, Sean and Nathan will do their best to answer as many of those questions as possible. Um, we'll also be posting the recording of this webinar on our blog at blog.cbtnuggets.com. All right, Sean and Nate, take it away. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about Docker, which the title probably gave a lot of that away. Uh, I have Nate with me today because he uses DevOps on a daily basis as CBT Nuggets. Uh, he, he's more familiar with the day in and day out workings of uh, Docker itself. And so it's going to be great to hear from him today. The, what we're going to start with, though, is I want to talk about if you watched my last webinar about Docker, we learned how to think the Docker way. Um, traditionally, you know, I've been a sysadmin for a long time, and so if I needed to get an application going, I would install a server. And that server would have all the things installed that I needed. You know, I have Tomcat, and Nginx, and Redis, and MySQL, whatever I would need in order to uh, get the application running, and we'd install an application on top of it. With Docker, now I feel like I'm selling Docker here, but with Docker, the cool part is you can break all of those things down into containers. And so I don't have to worry about installing Tomcat, for example, because there's an image with Tomcat already installed and running. I just you know, get that container going. Same thing with you know, Redis database, uh, MySQL, um, and Nginx reverse proxy. I can put all of these pieces together as individual containers, and then I can have my app uh, you know, that I actually write in – oh, speaking of writing, well, I really shouldn't write with this. But that says app for anybody who can't know. <laughs> um, my app kind of plugs into this whole world, and I've reused all of those containers that other people have set up, and I can spin them up and just worry about developing my app, not installing things on servers or, or worrying about that. However, what usually happens when I do something like that, for example, in my house I installed – uh, Plex Media Server as a, a Docker container, and there were some other things I needed to do. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work quite right. So I usually get this perfectly designed infrastructure ready to go. I'm so happy with how it's designed, and then sure enough, I get a couple pieces that just aren't quite right. My whole system falls apart. It does not work, and I'm frustrated. So what what do I end up doing? I end up making a container because I'm using Docker. It's the way to go. It's the future. And it is really cool. However, usually what happens, I create a, an image that has Tomcat and Nginx and Redis and MySQL all inside one container so they can talk to each other. I don't have to worry about trying to get them to communicate over the network. You know, the volume is all inside the same container. And you might notice, hey, Sean, your containerized Docker system looks a lot like your traditional server looks, right? The only difference is rather instead of having a VM running a server, you know, I have a Docker running, running a container. And while I may get a few advantages of being able to build and destroy that container quickly, I really lost a lot of what it means to, or a lot of the advantages of using Docker in that I can concentrate on my code and reuse other containers and stuff like that. So, if this is something that you're struggling with, it's funny, this isn't a problem that we even knew we had. Uh, but the folks at Docker, maybe they're like me and you know, notice this sort of thing happening. Um, maybe they just are better at thinking in it ahead than I am. But nonetheless, they came up with a program called Docker Compose. It's part of the Docker family. You can download it, uh, get it on your computer. And it allows you to do all of this Stuff that's kind of complicated, you know, like tying things, networks together. What if they have a volume that, you know, they need to share here and share here? All of those things can be automated so that you don't have to worry about spinning up container and after container trying to make sure you have the network ports and the volumes and the, all that correct. So what I've done is I've stolen somebody else's idea because <laughs> that's what open source people do, right? We use other people's code. Uh, the folks at Docker came up with this really great example application, and it's a voting application. You Basically, you vote yes or no or one or two or should Sean dance during the webinar, should he not? And what happens is they've, they've broken it into all of these different containers, right? The Python or the voting app itself is written in Python, so that's in a Python container. And they use a Redis database, and they use a Java 
container to actually calculate their votes, and they store the results in a Postgres database. And then if you want to see the results on your web browser, you know, there's a, there's a separate Java app script for that. Now, honestly, this is a little overkill for what the application itself actually does. But what they wanted to do is make an app that shows you how to automate all these various containers together so that they can talk to each other, have access to the data that they need from container to container. And so I've given Nate a big challenge. I said, Nate, with this awesome example, can you show us the steps that we would have to do in order to make this happen on, in our Docker environment? And I don't mean using Docker Compose yet. I just mean if we were to be traditional DevOps people, how would we make this happen so that we could do it? And Nate said, you know what, Sean? There's nothing I would like to do more than that. That part's a lie. But he did say that he'd be able to do that and he did. He got it all set up. So we're going to actually watch Nate spin up this scenario using traditional Docker tools and traditional Docker commands. And then we're going to follow that up with Docker Compose to show you just how awesome this new piece of technology is and how it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. So Nate, I'm sorry that I asked you to do it the hard way, but it's going to make the easy way so much better, right? It really does. And now I get to show off my typing skills. All right. Well, uh, I hand over the baton of presentation to you. So by all means, uh, you're actually running this on a local computer, correct? So you're going to be spinning it up on a local computer, and we'll be able to kind of see what's happening. And another thing I didn't mention, I'm sorry, I, I just gave you the baton and now I'm talking again. Uh, but not only is it important for us to see how the containers connect, but also Correct me if I'm wrong, but the order in which they're turned on and shut off actually makes a difference too because you don't want to you know, turn something off that another one depends on. So even the order with which you bring them up makes a difference. Is that right? Very true. They've, they've eliminated some of those dependencies. Uh, they used to have uh, linking for networking that made it a little bit trickier, and now they've added networking in the last couple of versions. But it's still you want your database available before you have an app that's trying to connect to it. All right. Awesome. Well, go ahead and show us the hard way really quick. I don't know if those two are compatible really quick on the hard way, but really uh, show us what's going on. Yeah, and, and yeah. And I might ask questions along the way. Um, so uh, not to distract you, but unfortunately that might happen, I suppose. Uh, let's see what we got here. So first of all, um, actually I'll just show you what this looks like. This app is available on Docker's GitHub page. It's just called docker-birthday-3. It was a, sort of a celebration thing that they did a few weeks ago and uh, trying to get more people involved and, and aware of what they're doing. And um, I'm running this on my MacBook. And on OSX, you need to run um, the Docker Toolbox, which is available on the Docker website. And that sets you up a little virtual in, uh, ENV, um, or maybe it's virtual box. Yes, virtual box environment where you can run Docker locally. So um, I'm not going to be using sudo because you don't need to with the way that this runs. But it does come with uh, Docker Compose 1.7, which is the latest. So um, this voting app has a, a bit of source here. There's the result app and the voting app here. And uh, that's what we need to actually build first. The other pieces are just stock. Redis and Postgres and um, this worker that they so kindly built for us that is a Java app. So first things first, we need to start creating a few images here. So when I'm doing this in a nugget, I have the, the luxury of being able to pause and rewind when I type things on the command line incorrectly. So. I apologize. I'm doing this to you. I am very familiar with the location of the delete key. And auto complete is your friend. So we build these two containers, and then the database needs a volume to attach to. So newer versions of Docker's have this nifty volume command. Let's see if I can actually type and talk at the same time. And so here we're just creating a, I mean, we, we learned about Docker volumes in our Docker course, but this is just a one line way to create a, a container specifically for uh, shared data, correct? Right. So 
So I'm establishing some network bridges here so that the services can talk to each other, which is much friendlier than the old link way of doing things. And all of these commands uh, have ls features now as well, so you can see that your stuff actually showed up the way you expected. Oh, cool. And now we can start running a few containers. So first thing we'll do is kick off the database. So all that we just did wasn't even starting containers. We were just building the images to start the containers. Yep, just getting the environment ready. So we're going to mount this uh, DB data that we created for Postgres. Now. Oh my goodness. Data. And then we can attach one of the networks here. And the database is definitely a back tier sort of thing. And then give it a friendly name and finally tell it Postgres 94. And that should launch us our database. Then we need to get Redis stood up. And that was in Zon 63.79. It's also on the back here. And we'll be using the Alpine Redis because it's nice and slim. There's our Redis container. Then we have this Java worker that handles the persistence. So we need our own that also on the back here. So using these network commands, it does make it a lot easier trying to figure out individual IP addresses and how to point one to another, all those, all those sorts of things. But this is still quite a lot of typing. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it really is. And you can script this. But then you'd also lose um, some of the repeatability, and you'd have to add a whole bunch of error handling and all that fun stuff. So we do want these things to be able to talk to the back tier so that they can hit the worker. And then in a minute, we'll also wire them up to a front tier. So this also does a volume mount. Ooh, I can type it. Right. And one more for the thing that we're actually going to look at. And so here, let's say we started one, two, three, four, five different containers after we built them all and set up all the networks to, so they can communicate with each other and created that, that container or that, that volume container that they're using for shared data. And I, I just want to say, all this typing is the reason that I generally build everything into one big stinking image. Because uh, while this may be the proper way to do it, my goodness, it's just so much work. Which, again, will lead really nicely into the next part. <laughs> because um, it gets a lot easier with Docker Compose. OK. So now we have all of our stuff up, we have an environment that we can actually connect to. Let's see if it'll let us connect. And it already found it. So this is hosted on uh, <clears throat> port 5000, as uh, you might have noticed in the, the mapping before. Uh, both of these web apps uh, expose port 80, but we can't have two port 80s. So we expose one of 5000, the other is 5001. So this is just a super simple little voting app. You click on the one that you like. Yeah checks that you've actually done it. And then if you go to 5001, you can see what you voted for. So that's all there really is to it. But there's so much on the back end. Can you imagine having to do that every time? Yeah, and, and that's exactly why you know, my, my initial scenario, that, that wasn't just me making stuff up. I, I truly, you know, when, after I did the Docker course, I tried really hard to do things the Docker way. Like, all right, I'm going to create uh, you know, a volume container so that I can store all my data in there for different images, and it'll be great. 
And then, you know, I, I didn't get the networking right, and it was just Gross. I'm like, okay, you know what? Everything is going to go in one big stinking image. <laughs> and I noticed that that image started to look a lot like the virtual machine that used to do it in the first place. And that's not even all of it. Now, if we want to tear it down, there's so much more. So to stop all this stuff, you can Docker kill and then use an empty little trick that gets the list in a very brief format that gives us all of our containers. So it'll go through there and nuke all of those. Otherwise, we'd actually have to kill them all by hand. And then we want to remove them all. So we do the same thing with RM. And that's at least cleaned up our system. Now, if we want to purge those images so that we can build new stuff, we have to RMI result app my voting app and then we want to clean up our networks uh, actually just our works for that back here now is the networking stuff fairly new to docker being able to do these like bridge networks back here frontier stuff yeah, well, it, it, it's not exactly new. They just made it a lot friendlier, starting with, I believe, 1.9, maybe. Um, okay. It used to be that you had to manage it with a dash dash link command, and it really mattered what order you started them up in. And if you lost one of your containers that was linked to something else, you had to kill the other one and bring them both back up in order, or it would never reestablish the link again. And it was just kind of a nightmare. Um, so we want to remove our data because this stuff definitely adds up over time. And we want to remove the result app. Whew. Okay, now we should be back Oops. to just some of the base containers, nothing fun custom that I've built. Just the basic networks. And those, I believe, are probably for the other containers. So, all right. All right. Well, now, Compose gives us. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just add too that I mean this was a lot of work, and for me, with you know, like if I'm training or somebody's you know taking the course, learning to use Docker, it is a little different situation because if you're just learning it and you're like, wow, I don't, my network won't come up, or what did I, how did I even? Create, you know, there's frontier, and then there's frontier without a dash. How did I do that? You know, we can just go to, a, you know, our VM and and restore an old snapshot. But I mean, you actually do this on a daily basis in the real world. So when stuff goes wrong at CBT Nuggets in the DevOps world, you actually have to fix it. <laughs> so if um, if you have to do everything manually, it makes fixing stuff a whole lot more difficult. Um, and again, that will lead into what you were just going to talk about: is how Docker Compose makes this sort of a scenario a lot easier. Yeah, and it's uh, much more fun when people are screaming at you and your website is down and you're trying to remember exactly what the name was. And yeah, so but anybody in our company would yell, ever. I mean, <laughs> no. no, 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 never. They would interpret that was just it. Like, a hypothetical. Yeah. That was a hypothetical. <laughs> but yeah. go ahead. Yes. So, so Docker. <laughs> this is now. This is part of Docker, right? Or you can download it. It's just a, another free component. Is that true? I mean, you can use this with the open source version of Docker and you have access to it? Correct. It's included with the Docker toolbox for OS X and Windows, and you can download it. Um, if you're running on Linux, there's like three different ways to grab it. The easiest one is uh, using Python's pip. You can just do pip install okay. docker-compose, and you get the latest and greatest, and keep it up to date really easy that, that way. Okay. So all you have to do to get Docker Compose into the mix is create a file called Docker Compose. And this is just basic uh, standard um, syntax YAML. Now, I had an experience with YAML that I think I should share with everybody. Um, <laughs> I mean, do. Indentation matters greatly in YAML um, because indentation is how it separates the different sections. I mean, it's, there's literally, it's not like you know curly braces in some languages. The, the indentation is what makes the difference. So 
it's more than just making your code look nice when you do indentation. And the other thing I learned by the School of Hard Knocks is to use spaces, not tab characters. Are those two true statements? Absolutely. Okay. So go ahead. That was my that was my spiel on YAML. <laughs> Very good points, and it's worth looking up the spec uh, before you get too carried away with this stuff to save yourself some headache. So anything after um, Docker Compose 1.6 and they're currently on 1.7 uh, is compatible with this version 2, and that cleans things up nicely. If you try to do version 2 stuff on uh, the original Docker Compose, it's not going to play nice. So what this does, aside from setting the version, is outline the services that we want here. And you can do most of the things that you can do with the command line tools in this file. So we can still define that we have a voting app and a result app and a worker and a Redis. And uh, we can even tell it if this is something that we have the source for to go ahead and build it if it doesn't find it. We tell it what ports to expose. We tell it what networks to attach to. We can tell it what volumes to mount. And you'll notice if you go download the uh, tutorial from GitHub currently, um, it is including an extra volume mount in the voting app, which it should not have. It's actually a bug. Um, we've got the worker here. We've got Redis. Uh, you'll note that you can specify the container name if you want. Otherwise, it will choose one for you, although it's not quite as fun and clever as Docker does on the command line. And then the database, you can do your volume mounts. And then this is all you have to do to set up your networks and your volumes is just tell it that you have one. And you can include additional information here, like you could tell it what uh, driver you wanted to use for the network if you didn't want it to be the default here. So that is it. Everything so that we just did with 20 lines <laughs> is right there. Now, does it matter what order you, you put the different sections in? Like I noticed in the services section, you have um, you know, referenced the, the volume but the volume wasn't even defined until later in the YAML file. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter. It must not matter if this works, right? <laughs> because um, <laughs> Correct. It's much more clever about figuring out how to wire all this stuff up now, which is fantastic. Okay. So that's all that goes into the file. And it's nice that it's YAML because a lot of languages, Python, JavaScript, have basic YAML interpreters, so you can go through and programmatically change this up if you need to add extra information or you want to sort of dynamically create this stuff. So now that we have that file in there, and note my current working directory is called voter because it takes, if you don't specify a name for your containers, it takes the current working directory and then the name of the service and then uh, an, uh, an atomic number incrementer. And that's how it decides how to name your containers. So with that, what? Now wait. Before you say, before you do this um, command, what's in the current directory? Because we have a folder that has like the the image building folders, right? I mean, these. So that's those three. I mean, I know we, we did them before, but my brain only goes back five minutes. So, <laughs> so the right. the results app, the voting app, and the worker app, those are the folders that contain the file we would need, like Docker file, to actually create the image. And exactly. the Docker Compose so, YAML file is in the same directory. OK. Yep. yep. So going into the voting app directory here, you'll see we have a Docker file here. And this is just a little basic something uh, to tell it what files to add. And okay, cool. to expose, and then to fire off Python. So it's uh, it's it's a nice simple app. If we go um, into the main directory, yeah, this is what our Docker Compose file. So it, it definitely expects to find that there. Okay, and that's fine. I just wanted to specify that those folders are just the the ones that have to be built. Those are the build directories, if you will, for the Docker images. Correct. Okay, go ahead. I interrupted you, so continue. <laughs> So now we just tell it that we want to bring up this environment and give it a minus D for detached or daemon. And it sees that those, uh, the, the, um, the voter and the result app have not been built yet. So it's just going to do that for us. So the terminology, this has to be on purpose. The terminology is a lot like vagrants, if you're familiar with you know, using vagrants to bring up virtual machines. 
uh, Docker Compose up, I mean, it's a lot like Vagrant up, right? So, I mean, is that the same, you conceptually the same sort of thing? It is very deliberate. They wanted to make this as friendly as possible, and it really is. So that's it. It brought everything up for us. It built our two images that it needed to make this work. And then you can see that it created um, that, that naming scheme that I was talking about, voter, my current working directory, underscore the container name, underscore one, and the worker and the voting app because we didn't specify an explicit name for those. And because we did specify an explicit name for Redis and database, that's how they appear there. And they are all up and running. So now if we go back here, we can see that this is in fact still doing its thing. All right, very cool. And then, so that begs the question, is it as easy to tear down as saying, well, let me guess now, this is, this is why I'm on the, on the call here. <laughs> Would you say Docker Compose down to make it go down? Let's see what happens. Well, look at that. It's as if I had used computers before. <laughs> uh, awesome. And now, does this actually do all those things you did, like remove the uh, you know, front chair and back chair? And, oh, actually, it says right there, remove network. So yeah, yeah, Sean, it does exactly what it says. It does. <laughs> Um, and now if we go back here, it's definitely dead. Oop. Oh, no such thing. All right. Awesome. Uh, that's, that's incredibly cool. Now, is there, um, you can download that YAML file right from that GitHub page, right? Right from um, Docker's GitHub page for the birthday example uh, to kind yep. of get a feel for how you do that. And there's probably, I'm sure there is, if you go to the Docker website, documentation on how to format one of those files as well. Um, that's actually fairly simple to do. I, I'm really glad that they came up with that. You wanted to mention, I know we only have like just a couple minutes left, but this allows you to also scale, doesn't it? I mean, you can actually do more than just make, you know, give yourself less typing. I mean, there's other things that Docker Compose will allow you to do. Absolutely, and so you'll see now this time it's already created the images for us and it started up in about one second. Um, so it's, it's really snappy. And one thing that we can do here, if we want, say, more workers, if the worker is getting a little bit overloaded, we can tell it to Docker Compose scale worker equals four. And now we have oh, and now the numbers at the end make sense. So now you can see, thanks to all the magic of word wrapping, sort of, <laughs> that we have four workers running and then the apps. Um, one thing to note there is if you do have explicit port mapping, like the apps do for 5000 and 5001, you can't scale those without uh, taking that out because you can't have <laughs> multiple things running on the same port. It won't just automatically increment or anything. Correct. Okay. Well, that that's incredibly awesome. And when you well, this answers my next question. When you do down, then it will actually remove all the extra workers that it's created as well. Exactly. So, well, that's so cool. If you wanted to, if you wanted to scale this old school, you would have to do the Docker run command again with a different name, and then manually take that out of the equation. So, so much simpler. Okay. All right. Well, I I hate to I hate to jinx it, but I believe the demo worked perfectly, which has never happened for me before on a webinar. Usually something goes wrong, so I will stop sharing your screen. Just and there, boom, it worked. <laughs> your demo was perfect. Um, that was awesome, Nathan. Thank you so much. I I actually am excited to do Docker again because, like I said, my my Docker world had started to turn back into just a bunch of huge containers that looked like VMs, but they ran in Docker instead of, you know, my virtual environment. So that's cool. And looking, any questions we had, I think I asked more questions than anybody else along the way. So thank you for your willingness to answer my questions while you were also typing lots of things. I appreciate that. Um, I, I think. I don't think there's any other questions right now, and we're finishing almost exactly on time. Uh, so I, I don't know. This has never really happened to me this properly before. So I'm just going to pretend this is how things always happen in Sean Powers webinars. 
<laughs> uh, thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, Nate, thank you so much for joining me. I know it's not something that um, is normally what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, but thank you for uh, doing the webinar with me and being willing to look foolish if something went wrong, even though nothing went wrong. Um, and I hope this helps everybody else. I feel like I should end the video with, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. <laughs>